Good morning and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Directors, the Golden Rain Foundation at Laguna Woods. This is a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation and the open session of the board meeting is now called to order. Uh, I do believe we have a quorum with, uh, with Martin. We have a, and we have uh, Egon that's getting some coffee. Okay, so we're ready to, to start. Should be a, a good meeting. So we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Director Millman. Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And everybody vote today. <laughs> Be seated. Again, so we, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we no longer state that it, uh, it is uh, the acknowledgement of the media because it's, it's fully recorded. The new age is here for us, okay? Uh, are there any uh, uh, changes to the agenda? Suggested changes to the agenda. Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Are there any changes to the approval of the minutes for February 6th and February 15th. Hearing and seeing none, the minutes are approved. Report of the chair, it's been a relatively um, uneventful month, <laughs> thank you. And we've been trying to just move on with all of our regular activities. Uh, there are quite a few uh, significant uh, initiatives that are happening in terms of looking at what, what goes on in the future of the village. Uh, and so that's, those things are still under study and in committee. Uh, and in some cases, uh, for instance, the space planning committee, that is part of uh, the uh, uh, ongoing agenda. And we will have a meeting tomorrow uh, of the space planning uh, uh, ad hoc committee. So I would suggest that uh, uh, that would be something that most people would be want to understand what's going on in terms of that. That happened as a result of the uh, closing of the security building uh, because of the uh, condition of it. So we, we were looking at what do we do in terms of either replacing or in some way adjusting for that closure. And that happened about a year ago. Okay. So with that, um, we'll go to the CEO report and I understand we have a special uh, presentation today with that CEO report. Thank you. I'll kick it off this morning, President, honorable members of the board, and then I'm going to pass it over to Chuck Holland, our Information Systems Director, for an update on the ERP project. I'd like to start today with an update from VMS, and that is that the members of VMS, 3rd United and GRF, recently voted to allow residents to be eligible for full-time employment. This will be implemented in the coming months as VMS staff and the board work to develop the accompanying personnel policy to administer the change that will allow our residents to be full-time employees of VMS. Now I'd like to continue my update by sharing information on GRF assessments. We previously shared the chart on the screen which shows that from 2014 to 2024, GRF assessments increased by $4.34, or 1.9%, which represents an average annual change of 0.5%. Much of the low increase is due to the trust facilities fee that owners pay when purchasing a new home. For reference, from 2013 to 2023, the consumer price index increased by 35.3%, which represents an average annual change of 3.1%. Today I want to share a cost breakdown of various 55 plus communities that compare average basic assessments, common use amenities offered, total assessments, community locations, home values and amenities offered, and much more. 
The data has been shared in What's Up in the Village and is available under the News tab on the Village website. The data is telling favorably for Laguna Woods Village. Laguna Woods Village is by far the largest representation with 12,425 homes compared to the next largest community that has half the number of homes and the total basic assessment that is more than twice that of United's and almost twice that of Third Mutual's. Also, please consider the following when reviewing this chart. Compare Third and United's total and average basic assessments to other communities that are significantly smaller and offer far fewer amenities. Compare the number of homes in each community to put landscaping, maintenance, and construction tasking into greater perspective. Certain utilities such as trash, water, sewage, and basic cable are included in Third and United's total assessments as well. Be sure to thoroughly review the entire comparison chart for more detailed insights. And then on the screen before you is a table that shows our sister communities. I'm just going to let Paul catch up. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this table shows our sister communities and how GRF compares to its sister communities. Specifically, you'll see that GRF has a lower common use assessment for amenities than Rossmore Walnut Creek and slightly higher common use assessment for amenities than Leisure World Seal Beach. And by slightly higher, I mean $15 a month. But in Seal Beach, there are far fewer and less comparable amenities. And lastly, I want to share a recent customer service enhancement in resident services. We call it Hold On No More. A convenient resident services callback feature has been, has been implemented. This alleviates phone traffic during peak call times and reduces hold times. Residents who call during peak times now may leave a callback telephone number as an alternative to waiting on hold. And they receive a return call according to their order in the telephone queue. And as a reminder, we encourage residents to visit or call resident services during non-peak hours, which is typically 1 to 4 in the afternoon, and during midweek versus Monday morning when call volume is at the highest following a weekend. And that concludes my update this morning, and I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Holland. President Hopkins, members of the board, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this morning. As is, I, just to give you some additional feedback on the hold on no more, in the month of February, we know we had a very large rain event. We did about 1,000 callbacks, people waiting in line. Instead of them waiting on hold, they took the option to call people back, and there's about 1,000 phone calls. So that's helping out quite a bit as far as it's, uh, from a customer service standpoint. And if you didn't read the Globe last week, we, somebody gave us a nice kudos in the Globe about that feature, and it turned out very well for them. So I uh, appreciate that. And, and I just want to remind everybody that, that VMS and through resident services are constantly making s small mm -hmm. but significant upgrades and changes to the service quality and the service content that we get. Sometimes they go unnoticed, okay, because they just happen. Uh, we don't make a big announcement of it. But I want to thank um, VMS and specifically resident services for all of the things that they do. I know when we experience an issue, and that could be 5 or 10% of us, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. But the 90% are experience, have a great experience in dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, resident services. I have been one of those 5 and 10%, and I've right. been <laughs> just as, not outraged, but concerned sometimes. But uh, it gets fixed. But thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Let's, so let's kind of start from the beginning. I know I don't, haven't got a chance to present in front of the board in a long time. There's, I'm sure there's some residents at home and in, in the audience at home who don't know who I am. My name's Chuck Holland. I'm the Information Services Director for the Village. I've been here, can you turn me up a little bit? I've been here for about five years now, uh, going on six. Um, and what, what is Information Services? Information Services, it's a combination of information technology and resident services. Those, that, that department was combined three or four years ago after we had some significant retirements within the organization. And so it just made sense for us to be able to, since we're modernizing our computer systems, let's link up resident services, which I think is our most important department that we have in the community, with information technology to lead the organization into the future. One of the projects that we're working on right now is something called an enterprise resource planning upgrade. We usually call it an ERP. And so to get everybody on the same page, let's kind of describe, if you could point you to the board, just kind of describe what is an ERP system. 
Essentially what it is, it's a consolidated business system that handles everything from your finances to your service orders, to your customer service, to your inventory, to your component management, to everything you do as a business. Currently right now we have, uh, go to the next slide please. Currently right now, your core business systems that you have here at the, at the community, they're 20 years old. We're using, uh, to put it into perspective, a 20 year old computer system, we've been using the same computer system since before smartphones came around. This is Microsoft AX and the, the infamous Stellar application, right? These applications have been in place for such a long time. They're heavily modified, they're heavily customized, but they're kind of one of a kind systems, right? There is very limited, um, the current financial system we have, it's a Microsoft AX platform. It's a multiple generations old. It's no longer supported. It's no longer getting updates and it's no longer getting patched, right? So. <clears throat> We have currently right now, we have various different software solutions that are all stitched together via API and via um, data synchronizations. When we move to a new centralized ERP, all of that older technology goes away. Yes, sir? Can you describe what API is? Oh, application <laughs> programmer interface. It's when two computer programs can talk to one another without somebody you have to manually input data into multiple systems. We can get these systems to talk to one another to share information. So it's a special program inserted to with, translate from this function to that function. Correct, okay. correct. But with the new ERP, that stuff goes away, right? With the new ERP system, we're moving to a centralized platform. Now, you can see there's some other, some other bullet points here that the reason why are we, why an ERP and why we're moving towards moving to an ERP, it's not because we want to, it's because we have to. All of these old legacy systems are end of life, end of, uh, end of support, so there is no choice. Utilizing technology that's not web enabled, things that you can't utilize online and you can only be in a uh, physical environment to get access to these systems makes it challenging to uh, uh, support uh, any future uh, uh, remote access and technology we want for our employees. So um, with this ERP, it's a cloud-based computerized system. It's Microsoft, it's in Microsoft Cloud. It's the most secure platform we can think of. There are other pr programs like Oracle and uh, NetSuite but we went through an analysis phase and determined, we went through all that analysis and determined that Microsoft would be the best solution for us. Going forward, when we, before we even started this project, during the analysis phase, we had to put together a schedule. We put together a line in the sand so we, here's what we're trying to do. We thought the project is too big to do it all at one time, so we broke it up into three phases. Phase one was gonna be heavily really finance related. That's the base of what, everything we do, and everything's financial related with the residents. Phase two was gonna be your field services and all your asset inventory management and your, uh, and your warehousing in phase two. And then in phase three, we were gonna circle back and get the resident services and all the resale processes. I'm really overly, overly simplifying. There's thousands of transactions that are going on in here. Ultimately, the, the original uh, schedule was to be completed by, with all three phases by the end of this year. Uh, but because of the level of complexity, um, uh, technical obstacles that we've had, we're not, uh, we've had to change that schedule and extend it out uh, by a few quarters until 2025. Reason why, check out phase two. Phase two, phase two is really gonna be field services, inventory, warehouse, and asset management, if you go to the next slide. We had to combine, in order for us to be able to do the financing, and uh, we had to make sure that all of that stuff was done in phase one. So we had to shift really phase two into phase one, so it's making it much longer than we anticipated. But now we've gotten rid of phase three, and now we've consolidated phase three down to phase two. So what that's really gonna look like, we thought that we were gonna be going live with phase one at the February this year. Now it doesn't look like it's gonna be until August. Um, looking at the overall big picture, looking at phase two, we're probably now looking at finishing phase two at the end of uh, Q2 in 2025. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hopeful that we're gonna get it done sooner than then, but I'm just giving you, that, what, you know, my best case assessment on that. Yes. If I'm reading this right now, I have a little advantage because I I'm mm -hmm. on sit on the ITAC committee. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think are you saying that from phase phase one was scheduled to complete certain things? As a result of completing those things, you've actually done some work that you would have done in phase two and phase three, correct? And phase three. Right. So you've actually, right. from a some perspective, you right. you right. leapfrog what you expected to do. It wasn't sequential. Some of it had to be done uh, concurrent. 
Right. Um, yeah. One of the biggest. Ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. One of the biggest uh, achievements that we've been able to do internally is is with the documentation process, being able to look at every single processes that's going on in the accounts and in, in the accounting uh, world, documenting, creating standard operating procedures, creating how to guides, and so making sure that everything we're doing now is completely documented. So going forward in the future, we're going to have all of these at, all of these um, uh, functions and features and tasks documented for the organization going forward. A lot of that we've already completed in phase, we thought we were going to complete in phase three, we've already completed that in phase one for accounting. Document, documentation for every process that's mm -hmm. built into mm -hmm. the system. So that's, that's also a value add that wasn't right. there. All right. Uh, we didn't anticipate in. working on that to the third phase. Um, also with phase two, you know, we, we thought that we were going to be able to launch our warehouse management, field services, and inventory all at the same time. Uh, that's not really the case. You have to get all your inventory in place first before you can start doing your first service orders because service orders impact all your labor and materials. All of that has to be on place, in place first. So uh, it is there now. We're, we're, uh, we're moving from a design and configuration part of the, t for the, uh, for, uh, of the project to a user acceptance testing part of the project now. We'll be kicking that off on March 18th, and that'll be for the rest of the, uh, for the, for the, uh, the next uh, next month. If you go to the next slide for me, here's what the the phase one go live looks like. Right now, we're in the design testing currently. UAT one is kicking off here on the 19th. That's user acceptance testing. Apologize for that acronym. Kicks off on the 19th. We'll do that for a few weeks. Make any course correct any course corrections, any updates on on uh, user accepted testing one. Then we do testing phase two. Then we have a mock go live in July, and then we go live in August. This is what we have. In, this is what we, have, we have planned. We have to keep on reevaluating this on a day-to-day -day basis. We have a third. We we are using a Microsoft partner. Uh, they're called Aventico. Uh, they they have about ten resources working full time on our project themselves. We have our technology team that's working on this project. We have uh, our accounting team that's working on doing the testing, putting together the test samples, working on all that stuff right now. But it's a lot more work than we, you know, than we anticipated. It's taking longer than we have. But keep in mind, we have 20-year-old systems that we're reverse engineering, we're documenting, and we're re uh, modernizing all these processes to take them from a paper-based system to a digital system. Currently, a lot of the systems that we have right now, there's a computer system that's designed to track paperwork. Well, we want to use a computer system that's designed to get rid of the paperwork. And so we're modernizing all these practices as well, moving, out, moving them into the cloud. Ultimately, what's the long-term objective? If you go to the next slide, please. Long-term objective is obviously is like we want to enhance operational efficiency, right? The whole exercise of this platform is to provide a better level of service at a more affordable cost for our community, both in capital expense as well as operating expense. It's going to take us some time to get there. If you can be patient with us, we're going to knock this thing out of the park for you. But our, this, it's, it's tough going, I have to tell you. Everybody's, uh, everybody's pretty... Uh, 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 we're pretty tired. Being, we've been at it for a good year now. Um, obviously, modernizing those business processes, nothing uh, hurts me, hurts my feeling when I see somebody pushing around a, uh, a mail cart with yellow inner office envelopes to pass out documents, and all that stuff can be digitized, right? Looking to digitize all those processes. Also, looking at our, our customer service systems, our work order systems, and our, and our accounting systems, they're all different systems now. They're all stitched together. Moving to the new ERP, everything's going to be on a centralized platform to make things much more efficient, easier to support, more affordable, et cetera. And uh, I mentioned the capital reduction. And then obviously, long-term sustainability of the community. You can't continue to run on homegrown built software that was developed 20 years ago, and it's 2024 now. Look, from, especially from a security standpoint, right? We know that there's bad actors out there who are continuously trying to penetrate and uh, get access to companies' data across the United States, across the globe. And so we, we want to stay one step ahead of the bad actors. And you can't do that with 20-year-old software. So again, to kind of wrap this all up, this is something that we need to do. This is not something that we want to do. And we're right in the thick of it, right in the middle of it, and looking to go alive with phase one in, in October 1st, excuse me, August 1st. And at the same time, while all of this is being done, we still have to provide the day-to-day -day right. service. You just to put it in perspective. <laughs> uh, last year, uh, resident services received 238,000 phone calls, 53,000 walk-ins, and completed over 100,000 work orders. That's in addition to doing the work to get the ERP right. done. Right? Right. 
Well, thank you, Chuck. I thought, uh, and I'll, I'll entertain the comments and questions, but I just wanted to make a, a, one last comment. This, this process started a couple of years ago. Okay? It started with a software study group. And the software study group was made of a couple, a couple of board, uh, board of directors from, I think, United. And they looked at things. They looked at the entire, uh, all the processes or all, the, all of the named processes within the organization mm -hmm. and said, look, we, we need to do something different along with, with Chuck and his mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how it started. So it is, it is major, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, it's being done uh, simply almost seamless to us, but his team mm -hmm. and, the, and the organization, VMS, are working their tails off mm -hmm. to make this happen underneath everything else that they're doing. So I want to thank you and thank VMS you. for thank all of that work. Okay, so we'll start from this side and go this way. Chuck, what's the training process with this? The first, there's multiple layers of training. The first group of people who are getting trained right now is the accounting department. The accounting department, they're, they're the ones getting trained up on uh, uh, purchase requisitions, purchase orders, inventory, uh, uh, AP, GL, AR, all the fun basic, not the basic, but all the financial things that we do, uh, project management, et cetera, et cetera. That's ongoing as part of the process. Right. The first group of people who are going to be trained company-wide are people who need to be able to submit purchase requisitions, and that's going to be happening here within the next month or so. That'll be the first part. The major training, now keep in mind, for finance, there's only really 20 people involved. This is not really impacting everybody uh, in the company yet. Phase two is the big training one. That's where you have several hundred field workers out there utilizing uh, the, the field services software. That's where the big training lift is going to happen, and that's going to happen later on this year. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning. Um, I saw a Wall Street Journal article about uh, this old softwares that, that are in place that uh, they represent a technical debt that to our, uh, to our national debt, it can be in the trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. At any rate, with the system that we're going to, mm -hmm. um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your comfort level as like when we go live? Will we be at the most current version of software and mm -hmm. like will or will, will there be need to be revisions? And when there are revisions, uh, is there going to be a lot of aches and pains in, in uh, you know, doing the testing to go to the next revision? Thank you. Yep, the name of the project, project that we're going to, you could probably look it up online. It's called Microsoft Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations. It's uh, Microsoft's flagship product, right? It's their number one. It's installed in thousands of companies globally, right? It's a global ERP solution. We are, at, nowadays, we're not buying some software, installing it on our servers locally. We're renting this software from Microsoft. So we can only, they do upgrades every three months. They do upgrades. So now, in the past, you could get behind on your updates, and now you have this technology debt. Now, Microsoft, they, they uh, enforce their policy every three months. If you don't do your testing, they're going to upgrade without you. So you have to keep up with the testing. The testing part we're doing is we're look, using autom automation scripts. Once we go through our first round of user, user testing and determine all the things that are critical for them, we can build scripts for those. So then we can automate the testing process. So every three months, we just run all of our testing scripts, figure out what's broken, what's going to be impacted in the, new up, on the, in the new updates, do those fixes before we go live. What we don't want to do is have a new version get, get uh, deployed we haven't done any testing, and the only time you can do any tests is when something breaks. So we're trying to get out in front of that. And that's just part of the, uh, the standard operating procedures for uh, this ERP roll, rollout with Microsoft. By the way, it's not just our team doing it. We're partnering up with uh, one of the Southern California's largest Microsoft partners. That's at Vantico, based out of San Diego. Do we depend on Microsoft then for our cybersecurity? We, we depend on a, a third-party company called AirGap for our cybersecurity. Well, Microsoft, yes, we're going to be depending on them, but our primary go-to uh, security app, uh, team is a company called AirGap, and the, comp and the technology that utilizes is called FortiGate. FortiGate, you can look at these guys online. Again, it's another top-tier level of uh, uh, hardware applications that provides cybersecurity, and it's called FortiGate. You can definitely look it up online. Yes. With the news this morning that all of Meta's platforms are down. Uh, oh, which one? I'm sorry, which what platform? Fa Fa Facebook and oh, wow. all of yeah. those are down at the yeah. moment. Right. Uh, and if a large company 
like that yep. can oh, yeah. have problems. Yep. There's risk. There, there's definitely risk. Anytime you're dealing with anything online, there is risk, but we're doing the best we can to mitigate those risks with multiple layers of security, both from an email security as well as a web-based security, as well as internal network security. So there's multiple levels of security, but you're right. There are risks there. There are bad actors who are trying to do damage to any company they possibly can at any given time. But that's why we have a full-time uh, uh, cybersecurity company that is monitoring our systems 24 hours a day. William? I mean, <clears throat> just to follow up on that, I'm, I'm presuming that Microsoft will provide the security for their cloud. Absolutely, and, yes. And we are adding a layer of security on top of that with the vendor you're talking about. Correct. And are also, because we have an internal network, right, with all of our irrigation systems or networking systems or fuel pump systems, all of that are running on our own network. So we have to make sure that equipment is secured as well. So it's a combination of Microsoft security for their ERP cloud solution. It's a combination of our community website and resident portal. They have their own uh, suite of uh, uh, cybersecurity. Then we have our internal network security. And, and our phone phone security. Now phones are online now on the internet as well, so it has its own layer of security. So we're trying to look at it from all angles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Egon? Chuck, I was just curious about the overall cost. Like, I know there was a capital yep. uh, portion of it, and then we're talking about, since you're gonna be leasing the software, mm -hmm. what's that gonna be annually? What, what, what once we're gonna do, um, I don't have that particular number handy, but it's very comparable, because as we move the new system and we sunset all the old systems from an operating standpoint it's pretty much net neutral probably be the same no 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 change in operating costs but where the big change is is we won't have to uh, do a huge layer of uh, capital outplay every five years for a new financial system new server farm all that kind of stuff so we're lo looking at probably pretty much net neutral in the operating but saving considerably on capital over time okay thanks yeah to net, to net that out it's it was justified based on the operating neutral, but mm -hmm. the future savings for having to reinvest in software right. on a continuing basis every five, seven years right. or so. Yep. That and, was, and that was a couple of years ago, actually yep. three years ago yep. we made that justification. Yeah, if you guys may or may not know, there's a term called software as a service. It's called SaaS. Everything now is software as a service. It's a subscription-based model. Microsoft Office, we use Microsoft Office here, it's a subscription-based model. Uh, Dynamics 365, it's a subscription-based model. Everything, that's the new model, right? People don't go out and buy millions of dollars of the software. They per, pay per user per month on the SaaS model. Yeah, in fact, I think many, I mean, I buy the Microsoft um, one, one Cloud or uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft, it's 365. One, actually, one drive, yeah, 365. With and one that drive. gives me all of the Microsoft yep. uh, programs. Yep. Whereas in the past, I used to have to buy Excel, Word, et cetera, et cetera. Now yep. it's all in the suite and I pay a hundred bucks a year for it, so. Okay. For, for instance, before you'd have to go out and buy a new version of Microsoft Office, probably cost you 500 bucks. Yeah. If you bought a new computer, they probably threw it in there. But now, you, they, that's not, everything's a microcharge now. Now they're paying you eight bucks a month, right? Instead of hitting you five dollars up at once, hitting you for eight dollars a month. But over yeah. time, they're, you know, they're, yeah. they're in business to make money. Yeah, well, we're 60 years old, so we have yeah. to keep changing. Right. <laughs> so, do we have to upgrade any of our hardware? No, that's the good thing about moving to the cloud. The hardware is in at Microsoft's data center. Now, we do have to uh, upgrade some networking components to keep us safe internally to make sure all of our computers connect, you know, connect safely. But we're not paying for any Microsoft security. That's on them, right? So that's a big benefit of moving to the cloud. All right. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Yes, sir. I, that was, that's a great update. I great. just realized, I think, uh, uh, recently that we really haven't updated the community. Uh, we started this a couple of years ago. We okay. hadn't updated the community. Right. And it actually started when a couple of board members who, I guess, weren't involved at that time, started asking a bunch of questions. And right. I said, well, rather than do that, I try yeah. to answer them question by question. Let's have a presentation. Sure, sure. Okay. And if you need to do a workshop where there's one-on-one, -on -one, we take it offline, okay. I'll, give you, I'll show you the whole, whole dog and pony show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, moving on. That was the CEO report, and so now we move to the open forum. And at this time, uh, the members only may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors. Uh, the board reserves the right to limit the amount of time in the open forum to 30 minutes in total and a member may speak only once during the forum. 
speakers uh, may not give their time to other people, and please, no audio or video uh, of the proceedings there. Okay? Um, so, with that, we'll start. Those who want to call in um, or either are on Zoom may also join. Calling in is 669-900-6833. Or if you want to email, it's meeting at vmsinc.org. So, with that, let's start the open forum. Okay, uh, first speaker is Chris Collins. Good morning, Chris Collins, 3306Q, and I'm here to provide an update on the work of the foundation of Laguna Woods Village, which we do on behalf of residents who are experiencing temporary financial crisis. This is about estate planning, um, and it's not just having a will. What if you suddenly become responsible for someone who suffered a serious stroke and could no longer communicate with you? What do you need to know? What if you were the one who suffered the serious stroke? What do you need to know about protecting your interests, both financial and health-related? The next broadcast of the Foundation of Laguna Wood Village televised series, which is called Planning for the Inevitable, will look at these issues continuing our discussion of estate planning. It will focus on planning for the possibility of becoming incapacitated. Incapacitated. This can be a really un uncomfortable topic, but one in which it, that is very important. Do you know what steps you can take to protect yourself? What are some things you can do right now? Should you have a durable power of attorney? Have you executed an advanced directive? What if you're alone and have no local family? What, if, what happens if someone doesn't take steps to protect themselves? What is a conservatorship? These questions and related issues will be focus of the Foundation's next broadcast, um, which will be aired um, every uh, Saturday in March at noon. Um, so you can tune in and hear Kay Blix, a local elder law attorney. She's been an elder law attorney since 1984, and she's the founder of the Elder Law Section of the Orange County Bar Association. According to Attorney Blix, State planning is an ongoing process. It's a continuum that begins when you are alive. She emphasizes that we need to plan for the possibility of incapacity and discuss some, of, some immediate steps that we can take. So if you'd like to review this broadcast on your own schedule, it's available on the Foundation website, which is foundationoflagunawoodsvillage.org, under a special tab, which is Planning for the Inevitable. The website section includes YouTube links for the broadcasts of all the earlier topics. So if you have any questions about the topic or the upcoming broadcast, please contact the foundation at the foundation at comline.com. And for more information about the foundation, please go to the website or the foundation of lagunawoodsvillage.org, and we have um, the availability of donations being made on PayPal or by credit card. Thank you. Next speaker is Robert Reyes. Good morning, President Hopkins and um, directors. Uh, first, I, I, I come here as a resident right now. And Siobhan, great uh, report. And Chuck, you all are doing such an amazing job. And it's good, you should blow your horn loud and clear because you're doing so much. And as a resident, I feel so good that you're taking care of us. We're well taken care of, and I appreciate that. Directors, thank you for taking care of the television issue at the drop-in lounge. That was good. You did your due diligence, you did your research, and you came up with a good solution. I, now that the gym is, Clubhouse One is closed, now the gyms are meeting, or everyone is, well, we no longer have gym uh, Clubhouse One, right? So I've, I've started attending our gym that's behind me at the community center. And uh, there were a few altercations and uncomfortable situations because at one end we have Fox News and on the other end we have CNN. And yes, yes, you know where I'm going with that. 
And so residents were calling each other names. And I'm not going to repeat them, even though they're funny, and I want to repeat what they said to each other. But it, it, I come to the gym to work out and not to be entertained and not to watch television. I use my phone and I watch what I want to watch. And when I was attending a private gym, they didn't have a television. You know, we all were in control of our iPads and our smartphones. So please help residents now, especially since we have more people in there. We want to keep it safe and positive. So can you turn off the televisions or just keep them all neutral? I'm telling you that as a resident, because I, uh, yeah, it's not good. Now, I'm going to put my hat on as a VMS director. And what I saw was residents attacking the employees and yelling and screaming at them. And our employees were not trained to be security guards or sheriffs. And they're terrified because they don't know what to do. They're being abused by our residents who don't know how to behave. So if you could help them by just showing us the Disney Channel, Sports Channel, Cooking Channel, you know, let's keep it neutral. I would really appreciate that, both as a VMS director and as a resident. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, our next speaker is Miranda McPhee. Good morning. I'm Miranda McPhee, uh, 531B. I'm here as the president um, of the Pickleball Club. I represent a club uh, with about 500 members. Um, you may or may not have seen recently, pickleball is now the third most played sport in the US, behind baseball and soccer, and that's according to the Sport and Fitness Association. And it grew by 52% last year. We play on courts, we show with paddle tennis, and the courts were designed to accommodate 250 players and already had more than 300 when they opened in 2019, five years ago. The number of players has since doubled, and we project another 40% increase in the next five years to a universe of potentially up to 900 residents and guests wanting to play. Crowding is making the activity on the courts um, pretty intense. This summer will be much worse than last, and that's not just the heat, and it's not the closure of Clubhouse One, but it's the drumbeat increase in demand from residents to play. And there's a hope, or should I say expectation, that our needs will at least be considered. On February the 8th, I made a short presentation to the CAC about the need for more courts. We spent last year exploring possibilities and concluded that any facility must be owned and operated by GRF and used by residents and guests alone. So we went to ask for help. The CAC unanimously voted in favor of our request for an ad hoc committee to study the issue. I understand our request is tucked in under a future agenda item of racket sports utilization, which are numbers, with all due respect, that tell us where we are today based on who bothered to sign in. They're not a projection of demand, and pickleball is the only racket sport that is growing exponentially. We are not asking for money. We are asking for an ad hoc committee to work with us, the club, to see what might be feasible in the village and how any project might be funded. I've lived here for 10 years. I get it. There's a huge call on time and resources. But we have a genuine and unique urgency to look at the options sooner rather than later, as we are still growing so fast. We have hundreds of players ready to help, and we will provide and research whatever data and information and trends you might need to progress this. I'm asking today that the need for more pickleball courts be kept in high focus, and that a study by an ad hoc committee of the long-term possibilities be started as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Reza Karimi. Good morning, board. Uh, I think the CEO report presented a really great data about the comparison between the uh, communities similar to us across the country and the state. Uh, 
One of the data points that I looked at that caught my eyes was uh, Rossmore in uh, Walnut Creek. And it was 1500 a month. I got a couple of friends there. I called them. I said, what the heck are you doing? Just move back here. This is very much cheaper. About that. What happened there is that that 1500 includes their tax, property tax. So the data is not complete. So what we represent there, although is information, but is not complete information. For the sake of community, when we represent data, we need to be accurate and correct. So there is no misunderstanding, because when I ask them about their part of the, you know, the, the property tax pretty high in uh, Walnut Creek, and they, you know, when you look at it and you separate the tax from the fees, they're much lower than our community. And they're very similar to us. So for the future, it's great information. I appreciate all of the information. But I'm suggesting that to represent the data, we need to be accurate and correct so people don't get confused. Thank you. Okay, on Zoom, we have Ellen Leonard. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. All right. Several things were going on. So, all right. Good morning. Uh, I have a comment on um, uh, AT&T um, uh, removing landlines. So in 2025, there will be no ability for people to have landlines. Um, I have a question regarding is broadband, are we doing anything about that? I believe that the senior community um, some of the studies have shown that maybe 30% are still using landlines. So uh, that was one question. I have a second question about Clubhouse One, and it's about the koi pond. I wanted to know if anybody has any information about the koi pond. Are the koi still in the pond? And what is the future for the koi? Okay, thank you. Uh, there are no more speakers at this time. Are there any comments or responses to the speaker comments? Um, Good. Do you mind? Thank you. Uh, the question of fitness center television will be on the next CAC agenda, which is next Thursday. And the koi are being taken care of in the pond outside of Clubhouse One on a regular <laughs> schedule to make sure everything stays good. And um, Robert, the problem over at the gym is an ongoing problem. And um, I want to point out to everybody that most of those people that work over there are your neighbors. So let's try to be friendly with our neighbors. And um, if there's a problem, security should be called. That's what their job is. And I know that some people like Fox and some people like CNN. If they keep fighting, though, we'll have to do what we did over at uh, Clubhouse One. Let's see. Thank you, Miranda, for your input. And... Wow, that was a surprise about the landlines. I'm trying to get that. And I hope everybody makes sure that they watch the Saturday at noon for this uh, state planning. That's really important. I'm trying to read my notes. Hmm. Oh, I did want to mention one thing about the report that you had on everything. 
Um, I, was, I read an article on Fortune magazine, and um, they said that uh, 10 of the best places for people to retire. And uh, guess what? We were on that list. For, um, and it was about um, how economical it is to live here. And they said that that was strange because that was in California. What number? Oh, eight. <laughs> okay. I don't care if we're on the list. It's a big country. <laughs> anyway, um, that's all I have to say. I hope I answered some questions. William? Here's <clears throat> on the issue of uh, residents arguing with each other about what shows on the TV. Um, I mean, it strikes me that, that if we have resident misbehavior, I think we have you know, an entire process for dealing with misbehavior. And, you know, rather than change what we're offering, why don't we deal with the people that can't behave themselves? I mean, we're not children. We have done Whoops. that in the past, sir, <coughs> and we will continue to do so. Director Horton mentioned the need to call security to start that process. That's right. Um, the other thing is that uh, when that process starts, we do have a compliance department. And um, those nuisance things um, eventually get all the way up to the compliance department. Okay. Thank you. Are you gone? <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to make a comment on the same thing. It's interesting. I've been to the gym a lot, and I've never actually witnessed that, but I can see where it comes about. Apparently, there is no neutral anywhere. Yet on Monday, I think it was... The Supreme Court had a nine to zero uh, vote on an issue, and you should have heard the TV people after that. So um, the, the, nobody's safe. I think one of the things that you ought to do is put up a sign in both any place where there's TV, and it says specifically, uh, no arguing about or no ar any arguments or any strife about. Um, within this facility will, re will result in immediate removal. You got to tell people that so you can implement it in a more, just the way that uh, communities put signs all over the place where you can't park here, there, anywhere. You got to have a reason for it, but then do it every single time and it'll stop. Okay? That's my comment. Any more comments? Yeah, I, I just have a, a couple of comments. I, I, I tend to agree with Bill. It's individual behavior. I'm not sure how the responsibility shifts to GRF or VMS or to the board or to the employees. It's our individual behavior that we need to control. And I know that's not possible. That's all the time. And that's why we have security. It, okay? That's why we have security. <clears throat> um, the other thing is I think uh, we are looking at uh, the pickleball solution. It's obviously not a simple solution. Uh, it takes a lot, and it, is, uh, it will most likely will require some level of investment, meaning reserve spending. So that's a whole other issue. But we've got to, we do have to address the problem. It is the, from what I understand, she mentioned it's the eighth, Largest, but I think it's the fastest growing sport. Number two? Oh, three. Okay. So it is something that uh, uh, all communities have had to address. If you look around, uh, the pickleball courts just blossoming all over the place. So we are just a, a microcosm of the rest of society at this moment. Uh, the other thing is. Um, we will take a look at I, I, the, the interconnectivity between, I'll call a provider like AT&T and them using our lines. I, our lines will continue to remain. AT&T is just no longer going to provide the service. So I'm going to take a look at how, what the technology is on that. And I guess Martin, Martin's got to Yeah, I just wanted up. to jump into that okay. a little bit. And maybe it, uh, my, Robert Carroll might... Uh, Helping that uh, is AT and T our sole provider of uh, a dial up. I mean, there are so many other uh, sources that uh, can be contracted with that uh, 
Uh, I don't know. I, I, we've never delved into that uh, topic. Right. That's why I said we just we'll yeah. we'll address it in either a committee or some someplace else. But I just wasn't aware of how it all worked. I know yeah. we've got the lines. I didn't realize. I, I haven't had a landmine in thirty years. So Robert, do you years. have any information about that? I don't have any information on that with me this morning, but I'll check with our uh, broadband manager, Paul Ortiz, to see what he knows about that uh, subject. Mm -hmm. yeah, there should be uh, other options easily, uh, just well, because we'll, AT&T we'll is dropping out. We'll figure that out. Yeah. yeah. Just... And regarding uh, the, 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 um, <laughs> the clubhouse thing, I mean, you know, there's the First Amendment rights that people have to oh. express themselves. Uh, However, it can do it in a constructive manner, uh, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's sad that it would come down to uh, having uh, VMS employees try to exercise some kind of conflict resolution in order to, you know, resolve something going on. Thank you. And um, one, one last comment. I, I think uh, when a... When some information was put out there, perhaps it did have a flaw in it in terms of the uh, comparison data. Uh, what I would appreciate, especially when it coming from a, a director, that information can be shared so that VMS can say, hey, look, we want to make an adjustment. Rather than bring it out in a committee, in a, a board meeting of this nature, I, I would think it'd be much more appropriate to go back to VMS, especially as a director, and say, hey, I found that this error, this uh, this information is in error. Could you go back and correct it? And if I could interject, it wasn't necessarily an error. We point out that there are different nuances, such as utilities being included in certain assessments, taxes being included in others. That was pointed out. Okay. So, thank you. We are moving on to the next... Moving on to the consent calendar. All right. Consent calendar. No, I'm sorry. Mr. President, I move the consent calendar. It's been moved. Second. Second. Any objections? Consent calendar is, uh, is approved. Okay. Next is unfinished business. Clubhouse One renovation update discussion. Good morning, President Hopkins and members of the board. I had the wrong report in front of me. Um, the site was mobilized yesterday and safety fencing was put up to secure the facility. We want to thank our staff who were there um, past 10 o'clock on Sunday night getting the facility ready so that residents could still stay in their activities. Um, a few residents who weren't aware of the closure showed up yesterday, but all were redirected safely and calmly. And yes, our koi pond is being well taken care of. It is actually the first question that we asked um, of the construction manager. Uh, we have a weekly service that comes in to clean the pond, and then we have daily feedings. Our staff are dropping by there every day. Um, other groups are starting to settle into their new temporary spaces. Um, staff have done their best to accommodate storage needs of the clubs that have moved, but there are a few that... Uh, we haven't been able to take in everything, so we're doing the best we can with the space we have. Uh, we temporarily relocated several groups to the community center, including seven emeritus classes, one recreation class, and seven clubs and resident groups. So what that means is it will be busier here in the community center. We expect the biggest parking impacts at the community center to be on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., um, I'll knock on wood, yesterday seemed to go pretty smoothly uh, with the cooperation of our staff here in the building who have parked um, further away from the building to leave parking available for um, residents and guests. And as reported by the fitness center, they were very busy from about 9.15 to 12 yesterday, but were able to manage all who attended. I think they had up to 50 people at one time, and they're going to continue to monitor and um, communicate with people about times that might be better suited for them to come so it's not as crowded. Uh, the fitness center will, uh, has expanded their hours, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., and weekends from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. We do also have our Clubhouse 5 fitness center that's available daily from 5.30 to 9 with um, the resident ID card access. 
Uh, we initiated a one guest only policy at all times for pickleball and the fitness center to accommodate the mass crowds that we're expecting. And we're still working on some creative options for some of our displaced drop-in groups, um, volleyball uh, being one of those, and um, shuffleboard. They've given some great feedback, so we're trying to find some suitable locations where they can go and just keep their groups together. They may not be playing the same games, but at least they can keep their groups together and still socialize and have that benefit. Um, regarding our pools, pool two is going to close tomorrow for annual maintenance for about eight weeks. Um, as I mentioned before, our pool schedules are um, changing frequently, so we encourage all of our residents to look online at the posted schedules, um, and we have schedules posted at the pools. And um, I know Robert Carroll and Bart Mahir are here to answer any specific questions regarding the actual project or transportation. Um, otherwise, that concludes my report. Please let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> any comments? Oh. Okay. I guess we're going to have it's a, manual, not Bart. We're going to have a uh, a technical update on Clubhouse One. Yeah, thank you, uh, Manuel Gomez, Director of Maintenance and Construction. Uh, as uh, Allison stated, uh, Robert is here. If you have any questions on the relocation of the uh, transportation hub, it seems to be going well, uh, and so far there's been no problems. On the construction side, the uh, cons the contractor is uh, on site and they actually have already started demolishing the restrooms, so that work is underway. Uh, they've got about two to three weeks of uh, what they call demolition, but it's really just removing items that are going to be uh, upgraded or replaced, so that work is moving along. Uh, weather permitting, we should be done with the demo portion of the construction in about three weeks. Uh, they'll do some asbestos testing to make sure everything is clear, and then they'll move on to the next phase of the project, which I believe is uh, to start looking at the replacement of the windows and the doors as such. Uh, we do want to inform the board about a pending change order that was reviewed by the Clubhouse Renovation Ad Hoc Committee last week. Um, as a result of an oversight in the showers, uh, the locker rooms in the showers by the pool, um, we did not include the replacement of the lockers in the shower rooms in the scope of work, but the, shower, the lockers are uh, pretty much deteriorated. They're, many are broken. They're not functional. And so we, we felt it appropriate to recommend to the uh, Clubhouse Ad Hoc Committee, and they uh, unanimously endorsed replacing those lockers. So we are working on a contract change order to re place 24 lockers at the clubhouse. Uh, preliminarily, we think that's going to be somewhere around the 18,000 range, or about $750 per locker. Uh, we will uh, process that change order in accordance with the board-approved change order purchasing policy. And um, any future change orders, I don't anticipate any, but if there are, uh, in accordance with the policy, I will report those out to the board. Uh, just as a reminder, your policy requires any uh, change orders that in total exceed 10% of your contract price or any specific change order over $35,000 requires board review. Anything under that uh, can be uh, approved by staff uh, with a notice to the board, which is what I'm doing here today. Uh, if you have any questions on the change order or want any more specific details, uh, we'd be happy to provide those to you in closed session. But again, this is right now we're, we're working out the details. We expect uh, a change order somewhere in the neighborhood of $18,000 for the replacement of 24 lockers in the shower rooms. There's no other questions. That's our report for this morning. Any questions? Okay. Uh, with Robert? Yeah, and just briefly on the alternate transportation hub, which is located just east of the library, that's going well. We had both our transportation supervisor and transportation coordinator there yesterday all day, just making sure everything was dialed in, helping residents that uh, maybe needed help and answering questions, that type of thing. Uh, but so far, so good. It's still early in the process, so as things come up, we'll adjust and, uh, and uh, help out as best we can. Thank you. Any more comments? Yvonne? Um, my question is uh, that 
it's nice and cool now, but summer is coming. Are we going to get some... I know that there. you said there's going to be some awnings put up where the people can stand under. So, I mean, I, I know they don't need them now, but... Yeah, there are two large awnings there already. I saw oh, okay, residents, great. I saw residents enjoying them yesterday. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't see them. <laughs> I didn't see them. Okay. I just saw the chain link fence. Yeah, well, we've, we've got... We've got board members that are right on the top, on, on the on the on the case. Yeah. Okay. Juanita. I'd like to add to that that the library is opening <clears throat> for people who need to use the restrooms at 9 a.m. and closing at 4:30. That does not mean the library is open to check out books that early, but from 9 to 10, which is our regular opening, they will be open for bus drivers residents, whatever, uh, to use the restrooms. And they were used yesterday by about four different people. So uh, I just want people to know they are available, but it is not a change in the library hours. Our actual hours of checking out books and doing anything like that still remains 10 to 4. Okay. Thank you. And with the board's permission, I'd like to move uh, uh, item C, which is the gate 12 update, up to, up to item B, and then move item B down so we can discuss the committee appointments after we have an update from uh, uh, Mr. Carlos Rojas on gate 12 update. Are there any objections to that uh, change? All right, hearing none, we'll go with the change. And um, again, I want to thank. Yeah, this this item came up in. Um, and yeah, this item came up in in a, and actually an, another session, a closed session, as to what's going on regarding gate twelve. Gate twelve was supposed to be updated, or at least we thought it was supposed to be updated, to accommodate for, and make some changes to accommodate the traffic flow. So we just wanted to get an update from uh, from staff as to where we stand on that. In terms of uh, any type of update, I know it was going to be discussed at SCAC okay. for any further action. There were some adjustments made to the lanes as far as folks coming in and then also the monitoring of, of traffic, both via camera as well as security personnel to make sure it, it flows appropriately and doesn't back up uh, traffic out into the intersection. But in terms of any other action beyond that, will be discussed at SCAC. Okay, and I, and I see uh, Chief Nunez is on to 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 accent what oh. you just said. So. Perfect. He may have more information. <laughs> yeah, I, you know what? I, I was looking in the audience for him, and I didn't I didn't see him. So I thought maybe you had stepped in in his in his absence. But I, I keep forgetting we have a screen here too that we need to I need I need to look at. So, uh, Chief Nunez, did you have a, an update for us on Gate 12? What uh, Director Carlos had uh, mentioned was uh, pretty much that. But we, when one of the things we did when we uh, did the started making it mandatory to check in at Gate 12 was what we were looking at was the um, was the process of getting uh, putting people into into our. Uh, stellar as well as um, our gate clearance system for visitors and we have found that that's been uh, highly effective for us and that the that the reduction of traffic going into there has uh, been uh, largely uh, reduced and uh, we haven't had the same kind of complaints from uh, the folks waiting to get in or causing traffic uh, jams onto the onto the major highway and we've also uh, have reports from the gate uh, ambassadors themselves that are are uh, reporting that there has been um, uh, really a change in compliance with the folks stopping when they're supposed to be stopping before being admitted into the gate and checking that their uh, their passes appropriately. So when you say a change in compliance, what is what does that mean? In, in complying, not compliance, the com our our compliance. Uh, department, but changing in, in complying with before we had folks that were just driving right past them, okay. you know, and I think that was just the culture of the habit that was created the practice. But 
Uh, now we have folks that are uh, actually st stopping as they're required to, to making sure that they have the appropriate press to uh, gain entry into that uh, part of our facility. Gate 12. So, uh, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but is there anybody else that has any comments or questions? Um, I, and and I'm, forgive me, but I'm not totally familiar with what the the plan was, but what we had heard at one of our meetings was that there was a plan to have a a gate there, an automatic gate there, and I had heard, quite honestly, that the space did not provide that, uh, that opportunity, and so there was going to be some changes in the process, and what I think you just described it, described to me was the change in the process uh, of entry, and has that worked to alleviate the traffic problem? I'm not sure I I actually heard the results of that when I, in your your comments. Right. Uh, uh, if I may, they we implemented what they we were calling a gate twelve uh, passes uh, that uh, that the residents themselves can enter uh, their um, visitors in, and uh, and those passes as well as the handheld scanners uh, that we also have implemented there have made um, access into. Uh, gate 12 um, much more streamlined and um, and it moves more rapid and we've monitored it ever since we've done these changes to see what traffic is looking like onto Moulton there and uh, and has greatly reduced that and we're not having uh, the biggest complaints obviously we're coming from both well really from both the people that are waiting to get in as well as uh, as well as the gate ambassadors themselves but the gate ambassadors that are working gate 12 have reported uh, that folks are, are are complying with the the pass situation and uh, and then the checking them in is has been uh, expedited uh, greatly and has reduced the traffic backup and queuing back onto the main highway. William, I don't really vaguely know <clears throat> why we made this change, but the, the question I have is, is, is the cure worse than the disease? I mean, what problem are we solving, and is the solution more trouble than the problem? Yeah, from, and I'll let uh, uh, Chief Nunez talk, but the, the problem or the identification of the problem was there was a traffic backup on Moulton. Yeah, people complain about getting in, but the issue was traffic backup. Actually, no, I'm... I'm going back a little further. There was a time when um, residents could just drive in. Oh, I and see. The, and the non-residents were supposed to stop, and apparently they weren't stopping. <clears throat> and that was the problem. And so we dealt with it by making everybody check in. I'm just okay. asking whether or not the problem of having people come in to the, to the gate 12 who were not residents of the community mm -hmm. was as serious as it is to warrant the solution that we have found, I which see. has become another problem. Yeah, and, and I mean, let me just say, at, at one time, every, every resident had a sticker, and they could be easily identified as they drove in. Now there is no sticker. So I think that may have changed the process also. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it open for discussion here. We're not, it's going to have to go to committee if there's going to be any changes, but yeah. I think it's a good, uh, good thing to bring it up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what I can tell you is that we have not had recent issues with traffic backing up. So the stop signs have been in place and the check of ID have been in place for some time now, at least four years, because I was a security director prior. And um, at least four years. Yeah, yeah. when I started, the stop signs were there. But we did have folks just shooting right through and not stopping or just kind of waving their ID. Uh, out the window as they drove by and then so it did take you know some effort to get people one to slow down two to go ahead and stop and then we did look at uh, doing modifications to have an actual physical gate and it was just very very expensive and a lot of hoops that we'd have to jump through through the city and and uh, it wasn't felt at that time that the expense w was worth it and so uh, before we were having folks coming in from the outside that didn't have permission, they would use the pickleball courts and uh, they would take advantage of other recreational activities there that are just for the members. So we have been able to curtail 
that uh, illegal entry, if you will, you will, and then the efforts that Chief Nunez has put together, that has been very helpful in terms of the actual process and identifying folks that are that are coming in. I hope but, that but I think what clarity. you said answered the question, which was, this is a pickleball problem. That, that we had outsiders coming in and just using our pickleball courts, and so we had to establish this no, system. It no, it just wasn't pickleball. It was, it was uh, uh, other facilities as well. You know, you have the lawn bowling, you have the restaurant 19. Restaurant 19, while they're required to look at ID sporadically, it's not something that's done with every single guest. So there was also, you know, opportunities for folks to go eat at restaurant 19 that weren't authorized to be in the community. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. What? Is there, what's really difficult is yanking out the card and try, as you're pulling in, trying to get it ready to flash to the guys, you know, and it's like while you're driving, you know, you're manipulating the card. Uh, but is there um, a handhold uh, RFID device that the guy at the gate could just like, uh, pointed at your headlight. If he sees that uh, it's it's a you know a read that's against the database, he you know he can just wave you on through without even having a flashy ID card. You know, it, it seems like there should be a a, a a handheld device for reading those things. The, there is a handheld uh, reader for the barcode on the ID, but I'll let uh, Chief Nunez if he wants to respond. But I mean for the headlight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is no, no physical gate which would activate the RFID, so, hmm. but, but, but I know SCAC did look at some other solutions, so I'll, I'll let Chief Nunez speak to that. No, uh, thank you, uh, Director uh, Rojas. We, we did look at whether we could try to find some sort of implementation of a kind of a red light, green light system with RFID, handheld RFID, and being able to just flash it out there and and a handheld system, and if it gave us a green light, they had a uh, RFID, but we don't have a system like that uh, to be implemented. And so um, we, uh, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Rojas has indicated, we did have uh, the handheld scanners that actually, by implementing gate 12 passes, it actually uh, created a system where we are now, we're fully aware of who the guest is that's coming in because they get checked in and it's placed in our system versus where before if you drove up with your guests, we, they would just be with you. We wouldn't know for sure. You would point to them. They would point to the back and say, this is my guest, and they would arrive with you. Uh, and because of the past, they can actually come there before uh, you get there or, or after you get there, they can come there to the gate and drive up without you actually being present as long as they have the gate 12 pass. So it's actually solved a number of of issues and better uh, made it more secure, I, I, I would say, for us and knowing who those folks were there, as well as having the video of the driver and the vehicle and the license plate with uh, LPRs and and such. So um, uh, it, the system so far is working out pretty, pretty well versus the alternative that I think was already brought up and moving the whole gatehouse back you know, uh, quite a distance so that we had a l much longer queue that we could put in gate arms and all of that and RFID readers for gate arms, which would, uh, when we started looking at all that stuff, I mean, we're talking probably in, into the million dollar range for something like that. And so I think the, the fix that we have for that actual location uh, is working well, and we haven't had any complaints, like I said, um, from our gate ambassadors uh, that we were having in originally when we had implemented this program. Okay, thank you. I understand this is continuing to be considered in committee, and I guess we have the committee chair that wants to make a final comment. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> encourage you to come to our security committee. It was well discussed at the last meeting, the end next week, last week. Um, two things, first of all, for somebody to see the RFID, they have to be in front of the car. Our ambassadors are to the side of the car. They would have to stand out in front of the car in order to see or uh, any device to read the RFID. Secondly, <coughs> our village rules say everybody should carry and have available their registration card. 
uh, whether they wear it around their neck like we do or some, uh, just have it in your pocket. But it shouldn't be something that you have to search for to go through a gate. If you are going, and that's why I think the gate system right now is working better. People have been educated and know, okay, if I'm going to go through the gate, I need my card. And they keep it out and show it. Uh, the other thing is, and we're going to look at that uh, in our new business, we've had a misuse of our cards. People would just flash, first of all, your Costco card looks a lot like your uh, uh, resident card. Uh, and so if they just flashed that, the gates didn't know that they were, and people learned that very quickly. We had people borrowing people's passes. We had people not turning in their passes and giving them to other people so that they could go in and use, and it's more than just pickleball. Um, Bill, we have uh, two or three golf facilities, the driving, not the driving range, the putting range, et cetera. Um, so... Uh, there was a great misuse there because people did not have to show any ID. Uh, they have to show ID everywhere else. They go through any of the other gates as a visitor. So there's no reason why they can't do it there. It was an education process. They have learned. It has worked out when people have accepted, I need to have my card and I need to show it. Going through, no problem. Thank you. Last, one last comment from Joan. I'm concerned that the gate ambassadors are becoming a little too relaxed when checking our IDs. Um, I go there often, so they probably know me, but you know, I get waved in and they aren't really looking at my ID as closely as they were. Uh, just FYI, just keep them alert, because that's been the problem in the past, as Juanita says, people using other people's IDs and so on, sneaking by, and I'm just concerned it's gonna get back to that. It seems to be flowing smoothly because they're letting us through. Just just keep them alert, that's all. Thank you. Okay, we'll close that discussion. And uh, thank you, uh, Chief Nunez and uh, Car Carlos, appreciate it, and everyone else who participated. It'll continue to be taken up in, uh, in or discussed in committee. Thank you, okay, next is the um, update for committee appointments. Uh, Director Milliman. Thank you. Resolution 90-24-XX, GRF Committee Appointments. Resolved March 5th, 2024, that the following persons are hereby appointed and ratified to serve on the committees of this corporation. I'll read just the changes and tell you which committees are just staying as they are. Community Activities Committee remains the same. The Finance Committee, uh, Peter Sanborn from Mutual 50 has been added as a representative and Sue Stevens is the alternate from Mutual 50. The ITAC Committee, uh, Bunny Carpenter has been removed. Turn the page. Uh, the, the Landscape Committee remains the same. Maintenance and Construction Committee remains the same. Clubhouse Renovation Ad Hoc Committee remains the same. Media and Communications, Sue Stevens has been changed to the alternate for Mutual 50. The Website Ad Hoc Committee remains the same. Broadband Ad Hoc Committee, Bunny Carpenter has been removed as the alternate from GRF, and Sue Stevens has become the alternate for Mutual 50. Mobility and Vehicles Committee remains the same. Security and community access remains the same. On the other committees, Disaster Preparedness Task Force remains the same. Laguna Woods Village Traffic Hearings remain the same. Select Audit Task Force remains the same. Executive Hearings Committee, Bunny Carpenter has been removed from GR, for GRF. The Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee Bunny Carpenter's been removed as the alternate for GRF. The El Toro Water District remains the same. Resolved further that Resolution 90-24-05, adopted February 6th of 2024, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation 
are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we approve these committee appointments. I Moved and seconded. Martin, any seconded. objections? Hearing none, the uh, motion is adopted. Okay. Uh, next is new business. Here we're going to entertain a motion to approve the GRF free structure for new and non-returned ID cards. Resolution 90-24-XX, GRF ID card fees. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation requires that all approved residents residing in the village carry an ID card with them at all times. And whereas the Community Services Division issues ID cards when a resident is approved to reside in the unit. And whereas all owner members, non-owner occupants, and tenants are required to return their ID cards at the time residency is terminated, and failure to do so may result in unauthorized entry into the community. And whereas all GRF ID card fees should be identified in one resolution and placed on the website to provide transparency and improve communications. Now, therefore, be it resolved April 2nd, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby establishes the following fee schedule related to processing new and non-returned ID cards. The card status. New ID card for non-owner occupant, the fee is $25. New ID cards for new resident owner members, there's no charge for the fee. New ID cards for lessees, sub lessees, renters, and lodgers, is, the fee is included in the application processing fee. ID card renewals, that's lessees and mutual 50, no charge. Non-return or failure to surrender an ID card, the fee is now $125. Unverified loss, destroyed or stolen ID cards not returned, the fee is now $125. Replacement card for verified lost or destroyed cards and stolen ID cards with the presence of a police theft report, the fee is now $25. Resolved, Resolution G, 94-100, adopted November 1st, 1994. Resolution G, 95-18, adopted March 7th, 1995. Resolution G, 96-103, was adopted December 3rd, 1996. And Resolution 90-18-35, adopted August 7th of 2018, are hereby supersided, superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the fee schedule shall, shall be placed on the website and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we approve this resolution for discussion purposes at this time and postpone the final vote until April 1st, Civil Code 4360. Second. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's been moved and second. Are we ready for the vote? Are there any objections to this motion? Are we ready for the discussion? I should ask that. Okay. Are there, is there any discussion? Okay. I I do have one item, one thing I want to bring up. I, and I see it was addressed in committee. Uh, but it seems to me that the penalty for those who may just lose a card versus those who may take steps to, uh, I'll call it abuse the system, is exactly the same. I'm not sure exactly how you differentiate between the two, but I can see some things where a person just loses the card, has to, has to come in and say, hey, I lost my card, uh, and as a result of that, this, you know, I need another card. There are those that would abuse the system when they leave, okay, and and uh, uh, or just abuse the system. Period. 
And maybe there is a, quote, period of time after you, quote, lose your card that you're subject to the lower penalty, if you will. I agree. The problem is uh, you have to have a police report now to verify that you've lost your card. And I lost my card, okay, and had it replaced, and then I found my card. Yeah. So I'm, you know, you now cards. I have two cards. Yeah. But I, I was never, you know, we, there was no fee. And uh, so that's nice yeah. if you just lose the card and don't have to go to the police to say, hey, I lost my card. Yeah. Uh, the, how else are they going to verify it? If, if you say you lost your card, are you telling the truth? But, yeah, and that's kind of, it's, my thought process is the penalty for or the charge for both of those things. There needs to be some distinguishing factor. Mark? Jim, is the current policy in place is that if you provide a police report or a security department report, you can get the card replaced at $25? I, I don't know. Are you in the Is committee? it uh, 125 if, if you provide the, po the, the report, yeah, that's considered yeah. the verified then, yeah. correct? Yeah. I mean, the police report, does a, uh, I had the question, do the police actually accept the report for a Lowe's ID card? But can it be police report or security yeah. department report? Uh, I think, I, I guess what we're doing is we're raising some issues that may be discussed under the next 28 days. Um, um, I do think that personally, I've got I've got some reservations about assigning the same penalty to someone that abuses versus someone who just loses. And maybe there's a time frame where, um, uh, if you lose your card, you have 15 days after losing the card to say I lost the card. Uh, from what I understand, there has been abuse as people who say they lost their card and then hand it off to someone else or actually leave the community and um, never turn in the card. So there's three different scenarios there. But. There's really more than three. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. Uh, I agree. Uh, it, tr in the past has been if you are a resident and you lose your card or it's stolen or whatever, um, you can get it replaced. If you are not a resident, then you had, and you lose your card, you don't turn it back, you don't get it, that's when you had to pay the higher amount. Um, as usual, we have some people who game the system and get two cards. <laughs> um, but my, I guess my main thing is on the police report. We'd like to encourage all of our residents, mostly if you're going to lose this card, you've lost your wallet, you've lost something, so you've got credit cards missing, driver's license missing, all of those kinds of things. Instead of just going to your bank or the DMV, you also need to file a police report. It's just standard that if... There's something stolen, particularly if it has items of value in it. They need a police report, and yes, the police will, over the phone, usually, uh, accept that report. Joe? Why, why not a security report? Why not our security department instead of the police? Mm -hmm. I mean, going to that whole effort of reporting it to the police is a big deal for many of us. And if we simply can call security and say, hey, I've lost my card, I can't find it anywhere, then there's a report. Is that possible? Anything's possible. We do have Pamela here. Maybe she can be the best one to speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> While Pamela's walking up, I mean, do I understand this to be calling the City of Laguna Woods police as opposed to our internal? Sheriff. Yeah. The sheriff. I'm sure they're going to love that. Thank you. I think I would just comment that the path of least resistance is for a resident to indicate I've lost my ID card. 
whether they have or have not. Um, I won't speak for the security department, but I, I know that they have a lot on their plate, and to add this as one more thing for them to document, um, the time it takes for them to write a report, get it in the system so those of us in community services could view it, um, it takes several days. It's not an automatic a gimme. There really is no way, I think, to differentiate the person who comes in and see it says, I've lost my ID card from the one who's gaming the system. I, I personally might look at age. I mean, grandma who comes in at 84 or, or someone from the towers, let's say, and claims that they've lost their card, I would tend to believe that. But we have to have a level playing field and treat everyone at the same, uh, with the same consistency. And so looking at the fees that were collected last year, which were insufficient to cover the expenses for the ID cards, I feel is rationale to um, raise the fee to align all of the forms and documents to reflect that $125 fee. Um, and to deter the bad actors from acting badly. And this kind of, kind of dovetails with your discussion about gate 12, the number of people who hand off their card to someone else um, to gain access. And the whole purpose, I think, of a ac gate access control system is to control access. And you want it for the people who are verified members or verified occupants of Laguna Woods Village. I hope that helps somewhat. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that there are a number of people, first of all, our rules say we require all approved residents residing in the village carry an ID card with them at all times. They're supposed to use them for any time they use any of our amenities or facilities. I can tell you from the library, that's not always done. Particularly residents that have been here for a while, they have their number memorized. Mm -hmm. They don't show a card, they just come in and spout off their six number uh, number because they have to have a resident number in order to check anything out of the library. Uh, <clears throat> And also, we have people that have been here for many, many, many years, and you can barely read their card. It has been used so much that uh, the printing is almost illegible, and the picture certainly is not current. It was 25 years ago. Uh, so I think those things also are something we should take into account if they want it replaced because their card is damaged. <clears throat> um, worn, whatever. Uh, is there going to be a charge? If so, is it going to be 25 or 125? For Thank people who, who come to the leasing office with that circumstance, they have an old, worn, illegible card. We do replace it at no charge. Right. They've got the card. It's just not as serviceable as mm -hmm. one would like. I, I think you should spell that out for them. Uh, uh, and, just, and we're in discussion right now, sir. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, uh, the, we're about to end the discussion. I just have one last comment as part of the discussion. Uh, as I listen to the commentary here, it seems as though for me, the value of the ID card is not properly placed by us. If we just, th and, and this may increase, oh, it'll happen over time in terms of behavior, but if, the, if it costs you $125 to replace it, you will value it similar to maybe your credit card and other things that you don't want to lose. But um, just, a, just a thought. So, any other comments uh, then discussion? Of course, I, I mean, the, we want to charge this money because we are afraid that people are going to game the system and, and get another card and turn it over to a friend of theirs. Um, I mean, are we afraid that's going to happen? 
Or do you know that's happened? happened? Yeah, no, that's and, happened. And, and how did we know that it happened? And why don't we put into place a sanction for doing that rather than, you know, charging people for losing their cars? <coughs> that much money. So just to... Which uh, we should Mark, have Mark. a barcode on the card that we scan it every time it's used for an amenity. And we know it, right there it is in the scan. database, it's, it's valid. Okay, yeah. I mean, it, we, it, it does read. It's a reader, so it does read. It may not be a barcode, as you say, but it does read. There are barcodes that are put on. Besides this, mine does not have a barcode on it. I've been here for 15 years, but it, and I don't know that my magnetic strip does. I know for the fitness centers and the pools, et cetera, they put a separate barcode on the back. And uh, we have not updated, okay, like yours, we have not updated the cards for all of our residents in ever. <laughs> if you get it, you get it until you die or you leave the community, and then hopefully you, you turn it back. So, but the issue, uh, the issue is abuse of the card, not, yeah. not whether or not it can be read, but the abuse of the card is what, what the issue is. Anyway, um, I think we've had a lot of discussion on this, so I will... Uh, it goes on 28 days. <laughs> Oh, we, have have to, a, we have to vote first. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Have you considered if it is a damaged card to replace it, how much it will cost? Yes, it says if it's a damaged card, you print it, give them your damaged give card. Give it back? You, get, you, you give them your damaged card, you get a new card for your charge. No, no cost right. for that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, uh, we've had a discussion. We'll go in it and go for the vote. All right, so with that, everybody should uh, press. It's on the screen. It's on the screen, so everybody should press. Not on my screen. Not on my screen. Okay. It's not on my screen. It's on mine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I have a question. Yeah, we're voting. Oh, we're done. <laughs> okay, have we? We're okay. All right, the motion passes 8 0. Um, <coughs> I will entertain a comment or question, but the vote is over. Well, you know, in, in my thing, oh, I'm sorry, it is on. I just had that in front of it. Um, there's a, a, another resolution in here about the Memorial Day half marathon. Did we passed that on the consent calendar. Oh, did you? Okay, I missed it. Okay, I'm, I'm done then. But I thought we had to vote. We vote on the Yeah, I get it. I'm just. Okay. Okay, Can so we go? That goes on 28 day, and um, we now move into. Does the board need a five minute break? No. Oh, wow, this board is all right. <laughs> We're moving right along. <laughs> okay. With that said, moving on. The committee reports, finance committee, and the, the treasurer's report. And the committee report. All right. Thank you. Are there slides up here. All right. Um, I think this. Yes. The first chart is includes all revenues and expenses including those designated for reserves, uh, including investment income, the transfer facility fees, and the GRF reserve portion of the HOA fees. Through the reporting period of January 31, 2024, GRF had a net revenue of 665, is that the, is this, yeah, there it is, I'm sorry, $1,000 with a total revenue of uh, 4.5 million, and a total expense of 3.9 million. GRF was 
better than budget by 279,000 with a total expense coming in lower than budget by $150,000 primarily due to less outside services and materials and supplies utilized than anticipated. Next slide, please. This chart shows the operating fund, which excludes the non-operating revenues, expenses, and depreciation. This report shows a favorable variance of 400, I mean, excuse me, $149,000 through the reporting period with expenses better than budget by 153,000, offset by non-assessment revenue worse than budget by $4,000. Right. Slide three. This slide shows our most significant operating only <clears throat> variances by category with green bars representing the favorable variances to budget and orange bars representing unfavorable items. Favorable overall, we had favorable variances in outside services of $93,000 due to services not yet needed, such as car washes and auto body repairs for GRF vehicles, lift ride requests for residents, and Village Breeds magazine printing. Materials and supplies uh, are favorable by $90,000 due to supplies not yet needed for such items as fertilizer for the 27-hole golf course, pool chemicals and aquatics, and computers and monitors and information services. All right, then we got clubhouse rentals and event fees of $70,000 primarily to, due to high event fee and room rental revenue at the Performing Arts Center for events such as King of Queen and Jimmy Buffett tribute band concerts put on by the Village Music Club and Boomers Club. And cable programming franchise fees favorable of $32,000 due to late invoicing of cable programming. All right, now our unfavorables. Um, some items were unfavorables included the repairs and maintenance of $111,000 due primarily to the timing of payment of software subscription and information services for the year. Although budgeted evenly throughout the year, payment took place in January. And uh, we also have broadband services revenue unfavorable by $73,000 due uh, to advertising as clients continue to allocate less dollars to cable TV advertising instead towards other digital platforms. In addition, sponsorship generated program in media and communications was anticipated to be launched in 2024, but has not yet occurred. All right, slide four, please. The slide shows our sources of revenue other than the assessments, such as fees and rentals. To date, we have received just under 925,000 of non-assessment revenue, such as shown in the pie chart. Um, by category, we can see that our largest revenue is broadband services, which is internet, set-top boxes, ad insertion, and premium channels, followed by golf revenue, clubhouse rentals and fees, and merchandise sales. Other revenue, which includes additional occupant fees, uh, sponsorship income, class fees, parking fees, RV storage fees, among others, amount to 15%. These, revenue, these revenues offset costs and help keep our assessments down. All right, number five, please. All right, this chart shows our largest, I mean, it's the usual our largest operating expenses compensation, followed by cable and programming expenses of the 3.5 million dollars including depreciation these two categories account for 76 percent of the total operating expense and surge professional legal utilities and fuel outside service etc make up the remaining 24 percent and slide six if we could there we go um, the reserve and restricted adjusted balances are shown here starting with the first column on the left reserve funds have a combined ending balance of 40 $2.3 million. Restricted fund balance have an ending balance of $4 million, including this in this total are contributions received this year through assessment, trust facility fees, and investment earnings. Second column shows the work in progress of $9 million for reserve and $43,000 for restricted, reflecting the amounts paid for projects not yet completed. Uh, the third column represents uh, the resulting adjusted fund balances of 33.3 million for reserve and 3.9 million for restricted. And slide seven, please. We have a slide here showing the resale history from 2022 to 2024. Community-wide sales total 67 through January 1, 2024. Most of these transactions generate the trust facilities fees or the transfer fee, 
used as a source of revenue for our reserves. Slide number eight. Um, the listen to this slide gives you an idea of where reserve money is committed. Of the 30.2 million appropriated by the board for various projects and equipment purchases, the remaining encumbrances against our reserve funds is 23.3 million, primarily for renovation projects. There are currently no appropriations budgeted from restricted funds. And slide nine. Uh, we compare our adjusted fund balances to historical balances for the past five years on this chart, showing the GRF has averaged 29.5 million reserve funds and 2.9 million in contingency funds. And I think thus ends my report. And uh, do you have a committee report for your meeting, uh, the past meeting? I'm sorry? I, you, you also have another oh, have a, committee I have, report? I have, have another, I have another report. I mean, yes. Any okay. exciting things happen at your committee? <laughs> we met. Nothing exciting happened <laughs> because I don't remember anything exciting happening. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, have, I don't have a further report. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, next is the uh, CAC, Com Community Activities Committee. Director Horton. Well, mine will be short and sweet. Um, it bears repeating, I suppose, um, that uh, Clubhouse One is closed as of yesterday, except for Bocce. We were able to fence around so uh, Bocce can still play. Recreation was able to relocate, here's the number, 110 rental groups. So bravo to them. Uh, looking forward, our village uh, will be celebrating our 60th anniversary. More details will become uh, will be forthcoming, and our next CAC meeting will be here in the boardroom, 1:30 on March 14th. And uh, MNC is the next one. Yep. And so, um, wait, 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 wait. I, what? Landscapes in between. It, and if I could jump back in just for a quick second, I, I mean, I actually did want to say on the on the finance committee report, we did kick off. The audit season for this uh -huh. year. We had the audit, uh, the financial audit review group gathering. We met with the, uh, with the um, uh, our, our accountants at uh, KPMG, and have a plan for going through the audit process. And one of the issues that came up is, what is the audit? You know, is it is it a forensic audit? Is it this kind of audit? Is that kind of audit? And uh, we made it clear that the this is an audit. So that once once affirmed by KPMG, we can know that the reports that we receive are accurate and and maintained in accordance with general accounting principles. Um, it is not a forensic audit. It is not a, a you know a, 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 a an assessment of how did you spend your money. It's I mean put in as I think and correctly in lay terms. It's is what we're being told how we spent the money how we spent the money. So I'm sorry. That's uh, that's it for the finance committee. Okay. All right. She she was gonna ignore you, but go ahead. I think landscape sorry. is next. <laughs> okay, the landscape hurry. committee. We only need quarterly, so we have to. <laughs> <laughs> a little idea here. <clears throat> okay, uh, landscape committee met on uh, Wednesday, February fourteenth. Uh, we started off with a. Uh, Wonderful highlighted article in the El Toro Water District newsletter that went out on our new irrigation system, which is complete, and we have applied for the final rebates on that. It's been very cost effective, uh, but they really highlighted it for the rest of the county uh, as to how what a good system it was. Um, <clears throat> we uh, got a report that the monkey puzzle tree trimming project was completed. Uh, those of you who have been down by the creek who have been anywhere near monkey puzzle trees know that they have seed pods that only come out about every two years and they can be up to three pounds. And people were very concerned about them dropping on their heads. Uh, and so what we did was we went in early and removed all of those seed pods before they fully matured and 
could drop, and that has been completed. And while they were there, they took some dead wood off this 200-year sycamore tree that we have down by Aliso Creek. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the big art, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, issues was the charging station. Now, this is not for cars, but we are put, having to put in a charging station for all of the new electric tools because the state has mandated that we can't use gas tools for our smaller tools. We have to use electric, and they need to be recharged continually, the batteries that go in there. Um, <clears throat> we have found that instead of three hours, most of the batteries in continuous use last for two hours. So we have to have a continual supply of updated batteries. And we've had to have this approved by the city. Uh, we've been testing battery life in the field, as I said, and, and we just show that we need more rather than less. And so this project is moving along, and we hope to have that in. Um, sprinkler system was completed. The other thing is, <clears throat> we talk about Clubhouse One a lot, but, you know, we have landscaping at Clubhouse One. And well, we were concerned that the uh, construction and all the work being done, it would get trampled, ruined, whatever. And so all of the landscaping was removed <laughs> to our nursery from the area. When the project is done in August, it will be re-landscaped. So it will be new and beautiful, just like the building. But don't worry, they're not trampling on our landscaping. Uh, <clears throat> we had an Aliso Creek update, and if anybody has not been down and looked at the creek, it's beautiful now. It's got free-flowing water, particularly with all of the rain that we've had. Uh, but we also started looking at West Creek, and there had been... <clears throat> A number of years where nothing was done at West Creek because there was a, a discussion about who it belonged to. We went into the uh, surveyor, we got the maps, we got everything we determined. It is our responsibility. And so uh, we're, we've got an update that's going <coughs> in to, uh, to uh, clean out West Creek. Um, and that we are, our next meeting will be in May. Like I said, we meet quarterly, so May 8th, 2023. Everybody is invited. Thank you, Director Skillman. Um, now we can move on to... Uh, Just a quick question. Yeah. Is West Creek the, uh, the area up by Gate 11? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll move on to... M&C. M&C. And... Um, at our last meeting, we, um, the committee got an update on the broadband HVAC, um, the equestrian center security gates, and pool deck on pool number two. Uh, the committee voted to create an RFP to replace the pool decking over at the uh, clubhouse two pool. And um, again, uh, Mr. West from VMS staff um, also gave us an update on Clubhouse One. Our next MNC meeting um, will be here in the boardroom um, at 9.30 on April 10th. We only meet every other month. So thank you. Okay. Uh, next is the Clubhouse Renovation Ad Hoc, Director Garf Hoffner. Yeah, we met uh, February 27th and uh, <clears throat> We discussed primarily just the uh, small addition of change of lockers, the change order for Clubhouse One, and we discussed mostly the uh, implementation of the uh, renovation of the restrooms in the pack, Clubhouse Three, and uh, we will have a meeting on that uh, in March, but the date has not been determined yet. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next will be the Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, we are continuing our education of our committee in terms of the background of the space. Um, uh, we, we've got, we had a presentation which bit, took us back to 2011 when the whole idea of having to replace uh, the security building, that is Building E, came up. Uh, and apparently for many reasons it's been put off 
for various reasons for, or put it this way, other alternatives have been come have come up in in terms of its place. So, the issue itself goes back to 2011, and so we're just getting ourselves an education on where we've been, so that we can make a better determination of where we've got to go. So the next meeting is actually tomorrow at uh, 1.30. And uh, I will, there's a possibility I may not be able to chair that meeting, so I'm going to publicly ask uh, <laughs> Director Horton to perhaps sit in for me. We'll have a discussion on that. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're on the spot. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so the next meeting is tomorrow. Next, we will have from um, next is the Media and Communications Committee, yeah. Director Milliman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Media and Communications Committee met last on January 15th. And at that meeting, we had the usual reports and decided that we would meet quarterly. So our next meeting is April 15th. We also, at the next meeting, we'll be reviewing our upgraded charter, and the usual reports will be greatly expanded. The next thing, uh, as the website ad hoc committee, is not meeting right at the moment because things are going on behind the scenes with UI meeting with our staff every week. They're working on plans for setting up the website, and it will, it will be done all at once. But they're dealing with things like navigation of the website, the search engine, the actual design, uh, technical aspects. And uh, at that time, there will be another uh, updated uh, committee meeting very soon, when, once the plans have been completed. But in the meantime, they're working like crazy. So I'm looking forward to that. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. Uh, next is the Broadband Ad Hoc Committee. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we uh, met, uh, it's a closed meeting that uh, we met on February 14th. Uh, we are in collecting a lot of data um, that uh, we are excited about its review. And uh, I foresee us having a meeting uh, somewhere in the neighborhood near the end of this month, beginning of next, uh, depending upon what comes back. And then I've also submitted a draft about a, a charter that is in review and uh, for the committee. And that's about it for the Broadband Ad Hoc Committee. And uh, Director Rosa, as I understand it, what the Broadband Ad Hoc Committee is about is Industry is moving from, I'll call it the cable TV environment, uh, to, to a streaming environment. And so we're looking at how that may impact the village and, and what we get into our homes. Is that? That is correct. Uh, we, we have a, a, a good system in place, but it's time to upgrade. It's time to modernize it and uh, that we're looking at all our options for, for the betterment to, for the community. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we'll skip over item G unless there's someone that also attended that meeting. As the chair is not, uh, the current chair is not in attendance. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have the report. Director Skillman did step in and act as chair. I apologize. And, and uh, so she does have a report for us. I certainly do. <laughs> All right, we met, met on Wednesday, February 7th, and <clears throat> one of the things uh, we looked at was to review the charter, and we gave it out to everybody and asked them to go over it in more detail. We're going to uh, take that up at our next meeting, mm -hmm. as well as reviewing the traffic rules. Now, what we have determined is the traffic rules, and that also comes under my other report on the traffic hearings, uh, are not uniform. There are differences between Third and United and GRF. And so we want to, we're taking all of those into consideration. We're going to have a workshop uh, where we look at the traffic rules so that we can make them uniform for the, the whole community. 
Uh, it was brought up that the city has a senior mobility program. These are available at City Hall. It is an excellent program. It's different than the taxi vouchers that they used to have. Uh, <clears throat> We now have the yellow cab uh, co-pays that are zero from City Hall to the uh, from to or from City Hall and the, and the public library. If you're in the village and you want to go to City Hall or the public library, you can get a uh, yellow cab free of charge. Uh, it's also free of charge to the Irvine Transportation Center where we've got Amtrak, Metrolink, OCTA, et cetera, which is just uh, east of us. $5 for trips up to 10 miles within Orange County. $10 for trips uh, that are over 10 miles within Orange County. $15 to or from the VA in Long Beach. And we do have an, quite a good number of veterans here in our community and they do use that facility. And if they're not driving, this is gonna be really helpful for them. And $25 to or from John Wayne Airport, which is also a question that we get all the time. How do I get to the airport? They now have this service. Um, there's no enrollment fee, but you do need to sign up. You go in and they give you a card and it has a number on it. And whenever you use any of these services, you give them that number and that shows that that's, you don't have to pay anymore. Um, You pay your copay to when you arrive at your, your destination, and it can be by cash, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover, and tipping is optional. Um, <clears throat> we also looked at the specifications for security vehicles and for our transportation buses um, as we look towards uh, budgeting in the next couple of months. And our next meeting is Wednesday, May 1st, 2024, here in this room, and everybody is invited. Thank you. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're signing up for this, you have to show your village ID. Yes. Your village ID, folks, is your key to the kingdom. You should have it with you. It gets you everywhere in here, and we also need it at City Hall to prove that you are a resident. Juanita? I got it. <laughs> that's, that's the card okay. that you get. That's yes, the I card. have one too. Yes. And it is an ID number. Mm -hmm. okay. Practically, this transportation is given by your cab. Mm -hmm. okay. All you have to do is saying that uh, what is your ID number and they will schedule it. Right. Pretty good. Thank you. It, it's an excellent program, but I'd like to emphasize that it does not take the place of our bus system. <laughs> Our bus system here is internal to Laguna Woods Village. And with the exception of picking you up and taking you to the library or city hall, these transportation um, choices are outside the village. They do not replace our bus system within the village. Martin? Yeah. Um um, William mentioned about a, a cost uh, relative to uh, um, our place for uh, Lyft and residents using Lyft. Uh, is that, what is the resident cost for <coughs> using Lyft? Yeah, well, but Lyft is where? only a very small window of time. It's not open, it's not available 24 hours. Um, it's open before our buses run and just after our buses run. Uh, and it is free to the residents. Okay. But uh, it, it's a very limited time period for the lift. Did, did right. The same as the bus route. Yes. Good. Thank you. Right. Well, it, the okay. lift doesn't go while the buses are running. It's no. before and after yeah. the bus run. Thank, thank you. you. So. Thank you. Okay. I apologize for almost skipping a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know I would do that. <laughs> Okay, uh, next uh, is the security and communication access. Again, we go back to <laughs> Vice President and Director Spielberg. Hey, <laughs> our security and community access committee. 
See, I turned away from the page. <laughs> it met on April 24th. <clears throat> I mean, the next meeting is April 24th. It <laughs> met February 28th. Um, we went over, had a good discussion on gates 12 and gate 5, any that go out gate 5 that know for quite a bit of time the middle resident lane has been down. They're still looking at getting parts. It's been very difficult to, to get that back up again. Um, <clears throat> but we hope soon that that will all be, be open. There was a discussion on that. Um, the other things that were brought up as concerns that we looked at were the exit from the pickleball and golf ones up next to uh, restaurant 19. Mm -hmm. People don't stop. It's, 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 there's been some very near accidents and there have been a couple that were actually collisions. And so what can we do to make that? There is a stop sign there. There is a, you know, a, a sign that says slow down, be careful, whatever. But they just run those golf carts up and back. And <clears throat> we also have a problem with people uh, parking for pickleball where they're not supposed to. They think they can drive down into the golf area and for pickleball. So we're looking at that. And the other thing that was brought up as a concern was um, our uh, crosswalks. Uh, that's a big issue. And what we have determined is we don't want to keep band-aiding different crosswalks with uh, temporary signs or putting up a stop sign, then that makes it difficult for another intersection down the road. Uh, it's, it's just a very big issue. And so we will be asking in our budget meetings for funds for a transportation engineer to be hired as early as possible next year to look at the whole crosswalk situation. Uh, where should they be? How could they be marked? Do we need stop signs? <clears throat> Do we need to uh, put cross marks on them? Uh, are there different ways or places we should have crosswalks that we do not have, et cetera? It's, it's a big issue in this community. So um, that's coming up. Uh, next meeting will be April 24th, and you're all invited. Good. Thank you much. And? Um. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> <of preparedness>. uh, <clears throat> What is it that you don't do, right? <laughs> well, the, I just do the security things, it looks like, and traffic. Uh, <clears throat> we did have the traffic hearings, and we have them every month well, on February 21st. And uh, there were five cases brought, four were found guilty and fined. Uh, they were mostly mm -hmm. failure to stops. And as usual, we have people that came in and said, I know I stopped. And we show the video and they said, oh, maybe not. <laughs> and this isn't just rolling stops. This is just completely going through stop signs. Um, we had one speeding and we did have one hit and run. Um, it was a, not a person, but it was a hit and run to a golf cart. And then they just went on their merry way. And so that was brought up as well. Uh, we had to reschedule one of them. It was one of those days where it was pouring rain, and this was a visitor to the community, not a resident, and they were coming in from Long Beach, and they called and said, can't do it. So we did reschedule them for next month, and our next meeting of the traffic hearings is Mar uh, March this month on the 20th. Uh, we're also looking at the letters that go out to people. When you get a notice of violation, it has to be within 15 days of the, the violation. But right now they call in and make appointments to either go to traffic school, if it's a moving violation, um, to pay the fine, in which case they don't come to the hearings, or to come to the hearings. But they've been given the choice, and we have people that have been delayed, 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 so that it's months before we actually see them at the traffic hearings. And we're working to... Uh, uh, speed that up. We're going to give them a date, and they have to prove why they can't come on that next date. Um, again, March 20th, 
it is closed, so I'm not inviting everybody to come, just the people who actually get a violation. That's it. Thank you. And now? And I think I'm finished. <laughs> okay. Well, Director Milliman? Uh, I deal it... with the Executive Member Hearing Committee. We, uh, The committee met last February 1st, 2024. Our next meeting is this coming Thursday at 9 o'clock here in the Willow Room. It's a closed meeting. Uh, we deal with problems on GRF properties, and it's... It's going to be in here. Well, it's, it's wrong. It should be upstairs in the Sycamore Room, or yeah. in the Willow Room. I think that's... I think this is a misprint. Okay, no, it thanks. says Willow Room. It says Willow, yeah. That's me. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. <laughs> it is. I'm th thank you. Yeah. It's in the Willow Room. And our books are there in our in our boxes to refer to the, the problems that we will have to deal with. Thank you. Okay. And I guess the disaster oh, preparedness no, is going to meet <laughs> on the 26th. <clears throat> Yes, we met uh, January 30th, and we'll meet again on March 26th. We go every other month on disaster preparedness. They had a wonderful workshop at Clubhouse 3 for uh, building captains um, and chairs of uh, the different clubhouses, and uh, they're, ex they're planning on another one in May. So we are really getting forward with our, our training on those. Um, did I say next okay. meeting, March 7th? And uh, next is 26th. our last is, is uh, ITAC, or Information Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, we did meet, and uh, Chuck uh, Holland basically gave us this a very similar to report to what you had today. Uh, he, uh, he dealt today, he dealt with perhaps uh, trying to have everyone understand the magnitude and, and uh, of, of the task that was undertaken about, or first thought of about maybe uh, almost three years ago now. So uh, you, you know uh, almost as much as committee members know in terms of where we stand, which is we are um, uh, moving along, uh, having some, some background, some delays, uh, but uh, actually nothing that is is uh, is going to short circuit the final product uh, and the effectiveness of the final product, which is I think we will see the benefits of in the future. It is an investment. Um, okay, future items. Uh, any future items to be uh, discussed? Okay, we'll go around director comments. We'll start start with uh, Director Garfoffner. Yeah. Okay. No further comment. Okay. No comment. <clears throat> I just like to remind everybody that committees are where the work is done. That's where the research is done. That's where the debate is happening, etc. By the time it gets to our board here in our board meetings. It's either recommended or not recommended by the committee, and it's gone through the finance committee if there's anything to do with money. So if you are really interested in any of the items that we're looking at, come to the committee meetings. You're welcome to all of the open committee meetings. You stole my, you stole my thunder. <laughs> uh, again? I'd just like to emphasize what, what he has said about the committees especially the committees that aren't meeting every month, because they might have something important to say, even though we might meet quarterly or every other month. Keep abreast of what's going on. And you can always find this information in the, in the breeze. You can find it in the globe. You can find it in the weekly updates. So please come to the meetings. Good meeting. Thank you. I have a comment regarding our continued efforts to make it digital, computer-oriented, uh, to save money, and that is very much welcomed. But I have a concern for people who are too old, 
too unsophisticated, who do not have access to computers or do not have the skill to utilize that, they will need certain items in hard copy. I think we should maintain that, we should consider what are the items that we should keep in hard copy all form as well. That's my comment. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of the directors and those who maintained in the audience, uh, and also the VMS staff for, for the support that they give us continuously as well as at this meeting. Um, and uh, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Right? I'm sorry, recess the meeting. I, keep, I missed it again. <laughs> I shall recess the meeting, and we shall reconvene, let's say, what, 12 30? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not too bad.